Okay, welcome everyone. I'm going to try this mic again. If it starts howling, I'll just have to turn it off. But let's see. You know, less of a strain having to yell all the time. Can you hear me okay at the back? Okay. Okay, thank you. Right, off we go. Let me go back one. So today's lecture is about Ithaca, Landscape of the Odyssey, or Searching for Odysseus on Ithaca. It's, the lecture will deal with the close correspondence between the geography of the modern island, which we'll look at in a moment, and the descriptions that we get of Ithaca in Homer, in, in the Odyssey. Most of what I'll say is based, first of all, on my own kind of very close involvement with the Odyssey over decades of reading it and teaching it in Greek and in English. And also, of course, during uh, the time of translating it from 2012 through to 2017. It only took me five years. This one, the Iliad, took far longer. Um, so obviously, I was very closely involved with the text all that time. And then the lecture obviously then will also be based on my very first trip to the modern island Theaki, Ithaca, in 2017, the year my Odyssey translation was published. I went with my wife there and to the neighboring island of Kefalonia. We'll look at those in a moment. That's when I took most of the photographs that you'll see in this, um, in this talk. This as you can imagine, it was a thrilling uh, trip for me, quite emotional. I mean, I'd been to Greece many times before, but I'd never been to Ithaca, because it's quite out of the way. And it was wonderful to be able to see all these places that I'd read about and studied about for so long, actually, in the flesh or in the rock, or however one would, would like to put it. And, and the trip was, I wrote the preface to my um, translation, a little bit of an affectation, but I wanted to do it on Ithaca, on uh, the island uh, so closely associated with the Odyssey. As I say, I was accompanied by my wife, Jenny, who whenever we travel to anywhere exotic, she writes a blog for family and friends. I'll quote some bits from that blog, because I, I do think she writes a very good travel narrative, and it gives you a good sense of what it was like to be there on the ground. Okay, I had this map up a moment ago. Um, where are we talking about? We're talking about uh, here's all of Greece, here's the Peloponnesian Peninsula, you can see the northwest part of it there, and this is the area of our map. So the Ionian Islands are these islands off the northwest coast of Greece, quite different from the Aegean Islands, which are much more barren and dry. These are quite wooded and uh, get a lot more rainfall, quite green. I was, we were there in May, which was fantastic. I'd never go to Greece any other time now. I'd always been there in the heat of summer. May was just perfect, warm enough to swim, but um, the air was clear. You could take photographs. I mean, normally Greece is covered in a kind of haze and uh, heat haze in summer. It makes it very difficult to photograph the landscape. Okay, so here's Ithaca. This, you can see it, it's essentially two parts joined by this very narrow waist here. It's only about 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers long, so it's a small island, separated by a narrow strait from the much larger island. It has gone by many names. Homer calls it Same, which I've put in there. Ithaca is the Homeric name here. It was then called Kephal uh, Kephalinia, and in modern times, Kefalonia. It's, of course, the island of Captain Corelli's mandolin, um, as well as being part of the realm of Odysseus, according to Homer. Homer talks about Odysseus leading the Kefalonians, um, so it seems to treat this all as a political unit. And so uh, there's, of course, Syra, Kerkira up there, which in antiquity people thought it was Phaiakia, they um, associated it with that fairy tale land of the Phaiakians. Now there's some argument among modern scholars about 
you know, scholars will pick an argument about anything that keeps them in business. Um, but Derpfeld, who worked with um, Schliemann at Troy, was, and he was a proper archaeologist, Schliemann was very much an amateur, but Derpfeld decided in the 19th century that this was Homer's Ithaca, which meant you had to rearrange the names of all the other islands around about. Um, he thought that was Ithaca, sort of argued that all the geographical things Homer talks about are really there. M much more recently, I think it was um, around 2000 or so, someone called Bittleston, who was a, not a classicist, he published a huge book heavily sponsored by BP, um, arguing that this peninsula here of Kefalonia, um, called the Palini Peninsula, was ancient Ithaca, which again had to rearrange the names of everything else round about. I spent a week on Kefalonia, and I looked very closely. He argues that this used to be cut off, the sea came through here. You know, it's tens of dozens of meters above the, above the um, sea line now. And although this is, a, you know, this is seismically a very active area, I think its theory is nonsense. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll be looking at why Ithaca is, Thiaki is almost certainly Ithaca. So here are the various descriptions of, of Ithaca in the Odyssey. Okay, it has a prominent mountain on it, Mount Neriton. The poem mentions that several times. Many islands lie close by. Okay, also part of the description of uh, Ithaca. Ithaca is narrow. Ithaca is described as rough, rugged, sloping to the sea. Um, it's said that it's got no meadowland, it's poor for horses, which is true of a lot of Greece, but particularly true of Ithaca. Uh, but it's very good for goats, as is much of, much of Greece. And finally, that it has, despite being rugged and rough and so on, it has many freshwater springs that never fail. Um, so, what did I find, you know, spending a week wandering around Ithaca, closely looking at all these uh, places associated with the poem? Okay, first of all, there's a mountain uh, still called Nerito, uh, Neriton. I mean, that doesn't really prove anything, but because the later Greeks could, of course, apply this name to the mountain, but it has that name. It's the tallest, most prominent feature on the island in that northern <coughs> section of it. Just take a, a, just bear this little bay in mind here, Dexia Bay. We'll come back to it in a moment. Many islands lie close by. Well, you know, there are lots of little islands. Off, this is off the east coast, looking towards the mainland. Uh, one there, another Meganesi over there, there, there. Zakynthos is down to the south. Um, Ithaca is rugged and sloping to the sea. Well, I think the picture speaks for itself. Now, you'll remember... Um, from your own reading of the Odyssey or from what I was talking about yesterday, that in book 13 of the poem, the beginning of book 13, the Phaeacians bring Odysseus and put him down asleep on Ithaca. So when he wakes up, he doesn't know where he is. And then Athene uh, meets him and she describes where he is and describes the island to him. He hasn't recognized the island because she shed a mist over it. This is a, just a, bit, a little bit of romantic nonsense, but while we were walking above the island, um, above that Dexia Bay, suddenly this mist came down. Um, you, know, you could see the whole slope here a moment before. Suddenly it was shrouded in mist. You see Neriton covered in mist there. I couldn't help but think, but think about that passage in the Odyssey. Um, Okay, carrying on with the features described by the Odyssey, which Ithaca is good for goats. Well, it certainly is. Goats everywhere, particularly this kind of long-haired, almost Angora-type goat with a brown face. 
rather nice little mother and mother and <laughs> child here. Um, the, the olive trees everywhere, as everywhere in Greece. Now, apropos goats, um, which were everywhere, let me just read you a little bit from um, my wife Jenny's blog. She said, we had come prepared for goats. We had the remains of two stale loaves of bread, some fairly disgusting carob rusks, which our landlady had recommended. When we turned onto the high mountain pass, there they were, hundreds of goats. We, I stopped the car and got out. Jenny was my driver. Um, she's not so good at reading maps. So I do the maps. And she would, and I would also always scanning the landscape for where I wanted to photograph next. So I kept yelling, stop, and we had to get out and take the next Odyssean picture. Um, well, there's Jenny surrounded by goats. <laughs> After one enormous billy goat in picture um, there started chewing on my skirt and butting me, I fled the scene and jumped back into the car. But the goats were not stupid. They knew you had the bread. So now they started butting the car. There it is in the background. One got his head into the slightly open window and refused to leave. I opened the back window, threw the rest of the loaf out and gunned the car out of there. Um, returning to the epic, so Odysseus, in book 13, returns at last to his island home of Ithaca. And Homer's um, Odyssey describes in detail the bay where Odysseus is put ashore. Oops. I think I must click. That's too... No. Uh, escape. Let, let's uh, next. Okay. Uh. Yeah. There we go. Let's get that in. Okay. Um, so this is the Odyssey's description. You can see where the passages are. Book thirteen. On Ithaca is the harbour of Phorcus, old man of the sea, between steep jutting headlands, gently sloping on the harbour side. So we've got the steeply jutting headlands. Um, at the harbour's head is an olive tree, and nearby a beautiful shadowy cave, sacred to the nymphs who are called naiads. Here are mixing bowls and two-handed jars of stone and so on. Here are great stone looms where the nymphs weave cloaks of sea purple, a marvellous sight. And here is perennial water. The cave has two ways in. One faces north and is the human entrance, the other facing south is more divine is the entrance not for men but gods. So quite a circumstantial close description. Um, now on arrival Odysseus so the Odyssey says um, it comes to this cave of the nymphs. Let's have a look where we are. Here's Ithaca. Okay. And there's Dexia Bay over there. There's Mount Nerito. The first picture was taken like that. And this is the deep Gulf of Molos. This is the main modern town on Ithaca, Vathi, which means deep because of the deep water over here. And the cave of the nymphs, there is a cave indeed like this, just inland from this, from this uh, little bay over about there. So this is the reverse shot from the slopes of Mount Neriton. There's Dexia Bay there. Okay, here are the steep jutting headlands. You can see, as in the description, there's Vathi over there, place where we stayed was kind of there, a beautiful view over the sea. Um, okay. Uh, you saw this before. Here's me and Odysseus's footsteps. As I said, not quite because he didn't swim ashore, but... I just had to swim ashore in Dexia Bay. Here you can see the inner uh, part of the, this right-hand headland. Um, the harbour's head is an olive tree. Well, I mean, olive trees come and go. But um, what's fascinating is that the Mediterranean is really more like a lake than because it's so landlocked. It has minimal tide. So you don't get into any intertidal zone. You get this sort of clear clear line between the water and the land. 
And you have things like olives growing right down next to the, next to the sea, which is uh, particularly beautiful and uh, unusual. Okay, the Cave of the Nymphs. So we set off from Dexia Bay up the slope, came to this cave, and to my utter rage, the damn thing was closed with a, with a uh, steel gate and a lock, and I sort of shook it in, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't get inside. I think it's too unsafe, and unfortunately. So I stuck my camera through the bars and at least got a shot. So this is a kind of antechamber here, you can just see the top of a ladder and a rope which goes down into the substantial body of the cave. Um, so this is you know, easily accessible by humans, and it does indeed face south, as, as the poem said. Then you go further up the slope, um, and I found a piece of corrugated iron which I ripped off, and here, there was the entrance for the gods, which is a hole in the roof of the cave which no human could use. Um, and that um, faces south, as, as the poem says. It's very hard to find photos of this thing online. I only found some stock photos. I'm afraid it's got LME stamped all over it. But this is looking, it's again, this is like the reverse shot. It's looking up from the floor of the cave, and there's the god's entrance up at the top um, there. And the broken stalactites everywhere outside the cave, they must have been much more extensive before which is pr presumably these were the looms of the, the nymphs referred to in the poem, where the, where it's kind of upright, like the, like the threads, um, the, the weft of a, it is the weft and the warp goes across. Here's again a, one of these stock photos, stone looms where the nymphs weave sea purple. Okay, um, this is a, a Greek so-called tripod from around 800 BC, about 100, a century before the time that the Odyssey was probably uh, put into its final form. Um, and we're told in the poem that Odysseus stores various treasure in the cave of the nymphs, including some tripods. We'll come back to these later. But I just wanted to show you one at this stage. It's like, it's, you know, it's sort of like a poiki on steroids. It's a, it's in a cooking pot on legs to put over the fire. But these things soon became um, symbolic objects, ob objects of display, to display your wealth. So the legs became impossibly long. And they just contained as much valuable bronze as possible. And this would be a magnificent guest gift or, any, or a dedication to the gods. OK. So. Odysseus from the cave of the nymphs after stowing his uh, treasure to keep it safe, he sets off for um, Eumaeus' cave. Eumaeus being his loyal swineherd I mentioned yesterday. So Jenny and I duly set off. The Odyssey says, then he climbed the rough track from the harbor along the wooded heights. Well, there was a nice rough track going on through the wooded heights the way Athene told him to the noble swineherd, Eumaeus. You found him in the boma, the courtyard where he had built, right round a high crawl in a sheltered place, great and fine. This is where the mist came up a little bit further on along that walk up the slope. So, so far we've seen that the geography of, the, of Ithaca fits very well indeed with the places that the Odyssey describes. And um, numerous coins have been found on the island with the head of Odysseus on him. He has an actual coin, not very clear, that took this picture in the museum. You can see the beard and the conical cap. Um, a medal, medallion has been made out of it. Which you can see that much, much clearer. There's the typical cap worn by Odysseus, adult bearded male, and here it says, Itha coin of the Ithacans. So Odysseus, a coin of the Ithacans. This is from uh, the fourth, the earliest such coins. Many of them are found on Ithaca. Um, the earliest such one is from the fourth century. So it shows that at least from around 400 BC, the 
you know, the locals certainly believed that their island was the Ithaca of Homer. Okay, it's time to leave Odysseus himself for a while and see what the Odyssey says about the um, hero's son, Telemachus. Um, you'll remember what we talked about yesterday, Telemachus's voyage in search of his father down to Pylos and Sparta and the suitors setting up an ambush for him. Here's what the text says about this. These are the last lines of book four, just before we leave Telemachus and go to Odysseus in book five. Out in the sea there lies a small rocky island, Asteris, in the channel between Ithaca and rugged Same, uh, with twin harbors and so on. Here the Achaeans stayed to ambush him. Okay, and then in book 15, when we come back to Telemachus, and Athene appears to him, warns him about the ambush, and tells him how to avoid it. Take to heart this other thing I say, um, Athene to Telemachus. The suitors want to ambush you in the strait between Ithaca and Same and murder you, but I think not. Steering your well-made ship clear of the islands, sail night and day, and when you reach Ithaca's nearest shore, send your ship and comrades to the town, while you, first of all, go to the swineherd. Okay, let's um, have a look how this fits with what's on the ground. Um, here, you know, just very roughly, this is Telemachus's journey. There's Ithaca under the red dot, and he comes down here to the Peloponnese, to Pylos, and then overland to Laconia or Sparta um, there. Right. Um, the ancient port of Ithaca was almost certainly up here. We'll look at this area a little bit later on. But there's a bay here called Polis Bay, Town Bay. So this would be the natural, very well sheltered by this channel. So the natural kind of voyage for someone going from Ithaca would be like that, down the channel. Remember, ancient navigators try to stick close to land as far as possible, because their ships were not reliable. It couldn't, it's very dangerous to be caught by storm out in the open sea. So the natural route down to Pylos would be like that, sticking to the coast, then hopping across to Zakynthos, and then uh, across to the mainland and down to Pylos there. So, Athene tells Telemachus, avoid the islands on your way back, so you can't go back that way. So one must presume a voyage, something like this, straight up here. She says, come in at Ithaca's nearest shore. So somewhere here in the south of the island. I've got him coming in just over there. Okay. So we need this small rocky island in the channel between Ithaca and Samir well placed to receive any ship coming south or north up the channel. Um, and how well does this fit? Well, very well indeed, as it turns out. Just to relate this to the map of Ithaca, um, that's where Odysseus went over the windy heights, and we'll look at where Eumaeus seems to be thought to be in a moment, somewhere down here. So I've assumed Telemachus comes in because the goddess tells him to land and then go to the hut of Eumaeus, and he sends his ship round like that back to Polis Bay up there. Now you'll see just over to the left there is a little island now called Daskalio or Bushi, and, but th this is almost certainly what's referred to as Asteris, the little island in the channel. It's the only island in the channel, and it has a superb view clear up um, north up the channel and down to the south. Perfect place to intercept any ship coming um, to the main harbor of Ithaca in antiquity. Okay, here's, this is Polis Bay here, beautiful bay up in the north. And over there you can see it's closer to the, it's not in the middle of the channel, it's much closer to Same or Kefalonia, so we're looking west here, across the channel, and there's the island Asteris, and here's the shot from Kefalonia. 
um, and there's the small rocky island. And you can see it's, it commands a perfect view um, of the channel there. Okay, so Telemachus avoids the suitor's ambush and he lands somewhere in the south and having landed he goes on foot to the hut of the loyal swineherd Eumaeus and there after 20 years he's finally reunited with his father. But where does Homer kind of imagine Eumaeus living on this uh, island of Ithaca? Well this is what Athene says to Odysseus. First of all, he was going to the swineherd, the guardian of your pigs, um, who's loyal to you and loves your son and wise Penelope. You'll find him sitting with his pigs, letting them eat near Raven Rock and Arethusa Springs. So two clearly named landmarks. Well, where were these places? Of course, the modern people of Theaki are quite sure they know where they are. They put up signposts. Um, and here we are. I love Greek signs. I mean, this one says in modern Greek, Korokos Petra, and in English, Korokos Petra. Which, that means ra the rock Petra of the raven. So it might have been nice to have the English version of it. The next one is a little bit better, Spilies Ephmeu, uh, Ephmeu Cave. Um, so it means the kind of grotto or um, a cave of Eumaeus in, genit in the genitive case, even in English, uh, of, of Eumaeus. Okay, I think our search for these, off Jenny and I went, I think our search is best described by her blog. So after lunch, we set off to find Eumaeus' shelter and nearby Raven Rock. Having reached the side of the mountain, there was one sign pointing us in the very general direction. We battled through spiny plants, finally reached the top of Raven Rock, a high white cliff. Uh, sorry, it's also Arethusa Fountain, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, so there's the rock. To my utter joy, we actually saw ravens flying around the cliff, but nowhere was there a cave of Umayas to be found. Richard, that's me. In trying to bundubash to a lower level, was attacked by all the thorny foliage and emerged wild-eyed, battle-scarred and dripping blood. It really took quite a lot of washing and bandaging to clean him up. See, I, I, suffer, I suffered for, to bring you this lecture. Um, well, I might not have found Eumaeus' cave, but there was what looked like the shelter um, place of a modern shepherd right on the edge of the cliff, so that will have to stand in for the home of Eumaeus. Um, right above this, above this rock. And the next day we went in search of Arethusa Spring, and again if I can uh, read from the blog, we set off early. We'd spoken to a couple the day before who said the path to Arethusa Spring was very tricky, and they were not kidding. Um, it was a very rubbly, steep path right down into the kind of gorge below that Raven Rock. The other hazard not mentioned by anyone was the spiders. Like our orb weavers, but looking like evil bark spiders, they festooned the path in their thousands. Oh, sorry, um, before that, Jenny, she does exaggerate a little sometimes. The, the path has a sheer drop off so that a single misstep would land you a thousand feet down in one of the tiny bays that are only accessible by boat. Well, it wasn't quite that dangerous, but beautiful walk with the sea and the Greek mainland off to the east, and here's one of these numerous little islands, accessible only by boat around, because of the rugged nature of the island. There's no road around that side. Um, okay, so the spiders. There, there, they, there they are. It was impossible to go under them, and we had to take turns to sweep spider and web into the nearest bush. No spiders were harmed in this manner. Well, I can't guarantee that. Uh, there were thousands of them, really. Every meter or two had to take the stick and sweep them into the bushes, but I had to get to Arethusa Spring. It was impossible to go under them, so on. The sun burned away, the early morning mist, and hammered down. We eventually came to the spring of the nymph Arethusa. I looked into the hole at the base of the cliff first, but the water was so still and clear that I thought there was nothing there. 
I mean, this is what you see, is this hole in the ground. Um, but I stuck my trusty camera in there with a flash on, and there's this beautiful spring of clear water right below Raven Rock. Someone had left a plastic Bugs Bunny children's beach bucket and a long piece of wire twisted around the ubiquitous olive tree with a large stone at the end holding the whole lot in place. Richard was insistent we drink from the spring. Well, who would, how can you not, <laughs> after all these decades of reading the Odyssey, not drink from Arethusa Spring? By dropping the bucket in after it had been vigorously cleaned by me, weighted with the rock, we drew up some of the water. It tasted wonderful, wonderful, but if we die before tomorrow, you all know why. Well, um, we're still, still here. Uh, here's drinking of the water of Arethusa Spring. <laughs> it was a bit bit pathetic drinking from a plastic Bugs Bunny bucket, but the water did taste great. Here's the rock and the piece of wire still scarred from the day before. So Jenny and I saw what is very plausibly the Odyssey setting for the homestead of the swineherd Eumaeus. But what about the home of the hero himself, Odysseus on Ithaca? To get closer to Odysseus, we needed to go to that northern part of the island the area where most scholars think that if there was some kind of Mycenaean chief from that period, the north would be where such a person would have their home. Um, oh, this is Raven Rock from below. You can see it almost looks like that outspread, stretched wings of a bird. It might also have um, added to giving it its name. Right. So, and the area for Odysseus's homestead, here's our map. Just take note of a few names because I'll refer to them as we go along. Um, Stavros over here is the main, Stavros, the main town up in the north. Um, something number four there called Homer's School, Aios um, Athanasios, so Saint Athanasios's church there now as well. Um, and Platrithia here, there's a plain in this area here, and then a number of bays round about. The Odyssey describes a number of bays easily reachable from Odysseus's homestead. Here's Polis Bay, which we looked at, Aphales, Aphales, up in the north, Frikas, I don't have a picture of that, but I have pictures of these other ones, and Kioni Bay over there. So the period um, that will be associated with the Mycenaean chief would be 1600 down to 1100 BC, the late Greek Bronze Age, also known as the Mycenaean period. Um, so it's this area here. There's that little ambush island again off Kefalinia. Now, no substantial uh, Bronze Age building has been unearthed in the north of Ithaca. But there are good reasons to suppose that this was the main inhabited area in antiquity. Um, lots of material evidence has been found by archaeologists, mainly just potsherds, uh, pieces of ceramic, um, but lots of it um, arguing for occupation of this area during the Mycenaean period. Someone asked about um, Schliemann, who I mentioned yesterday. Schliemann, he thought this, there were some ruins here on down at Iatos, he thought that was Odysseus's palace, as he called it, but they were much too late. I mean, they're not, not Mycenaean at all. So this is the area um, that certainly had Mycenaean occupation. Then there's also the name of the bay, as I mentioned, Polis, which always seems to have borne that name, Town Bay, which would argue that the main town was nearby. Okay, here's Polis Bay, which we saw already, the main harbor of ancient Ithaca, nicely protected by the channel and by these headlands. And this is Aphales Bay in the north. We're looking sort of northeast towards the mainland there. Um, there's Kioni Bay with travelers. Uh, it was a rather nice incident while we were having lunch here. One of the waiters came out and threw bread on the water, and a little fish came to eat. We thought, oh, sweet, and he threw a hook in and <laughs> whipped, out, whipped out a fish about that size. He took inside to cook for somebody else. Um, so this is another 
of the nearby bays. And this is the area around Stavros down here and Platrithia, which is um, kind of connected with the word meaning flat. It's one of the few, um, this is one of the very few areas of arable land on Ithaca. So it would be the natural area, main area for settlement. And there are also a number of freshwater springs, saw several of them um, while exploring the area. They're all associated with springs. A number of springs are mentioned in the Odyssey, but you know, which one is which? Uh, who, who would really know? Except for Arethusa Spring, which is so closely associated with a very prominent landmark. So this is where you'd expect Odysseus to have his homestead. As usual, the um, locals have little doubt. There's a place that's always been traditionally called the School of Homer. I showed you it's above that, just on the slope above that plain. And there is certainly a very ancient, strongly built well underneath there. You can see the entrance to it. And there are ruins from all sorts of er eras um, nothing much Mycenaean though, above this going up the slope. I'll just show you some of it. Um, there's a doorway. Um, it's rather nice ancient set of steps cut out of the rock and this large masonry, not from the Mycenaean period much later. Um, in the town of Stavros in the main, it's very closely associated with the bust of Odysseus up in the town square. And some enterprising archaeologist has put in a glass case a reconstruction of the palace of Odysseus, as he calls it, um, exactly where the school of Homer is. There the, you can see the stone staircase that I showed you a moment ago going up the slope there. Here's the, the main hall of Odysseus and the storerooms that are mentioned in Book 22, the living quarters and so on. But really, this is pretty much fantasy. I mean, it's nice to have something to look at, at least, and to, to photograph. Right. Um, before I uh, finish, I want to, going back to that tripod that we looked at a little bit earlier, um, I want to tell you about an amazing 20th century um, archaeological discovery on Ithaca. And to my mind, this shows really beyond doubt that modern Thearchy is the island that Homer was thinking of in the Odyssey and that the ancient Greeks thought was ancient Ithaca. OK, we go back to. Um, oh, sorry, I should have uh, read you this. So, in the Odyssey, in Book 13, Alcinous, the chief of the Phaeacians, is speaking to 12 elders at a banquet. Okay, so there are 13 of them there, him and the 12 elders. Then Alcinous answered him and said, Odysseus, since you've come to my high-roofed hall and threshold, I think that you've suffered much, you will now stay on course and reach your home. But I order and command each man, and then I leave out of it, come, let us each give him a tripod and a bowl. Later we'll recoup it by a tax upon the tribe, since it's hard to give for free. See, tax regimes haven't changed that much in uh, 3,000 years. <laughs> um, okay, the, the story of discovery here um, begins in the 19th century. Here's Polis Bay. Sometime in the 1860s, a local man, a, doc, a certain medical doctor, Loizos, he dug in a sea cave on the side of Polis Bay, um, and the cave still bears his name as a sign um, that that's where it is. We'll see it, it, uh, what it looks like close up in a moment. Um, my wife and I battled our way over the rocks and sea urchins to get there. Um, and then once we got there, we saw there was a nice path going uh, <laughs> through the trees there. And in fact, there was a sign, um, Spileo Loizu, the cave of Loizos. Um, so in the 1860s, this local Dr. Loizos dug in this cave there. 
on the side of Polis Bay, and he found one complete tripod there, together with the bowl and apparently a number of gold objects. But um, very sadly, he was just a mercenary. Um, he sold off the gold in a shocking act of vandalism. He melted down the tripod for its bronze, just for its bullion, you know, its sort of minor bullion value. So um, then about 70, uh, uh, sorry, OK, there we, there's another, another pick, uh, a little bit zoomed in. And this is what it looks like close up now. Um, then about um, 70 years later, in the 1930s, a Louisa's cave was scientifically excavated by a proper, proper archaeologist from the British School of Archaeology in Athens, one Sylvia Benton. Um, it was a, t a very difficult excavation because the roof of the cave had already collapsed and says it's a very seismic area. It was an appalling earthquake in the 1950s, which completely wrecked both Kefalonia and Ithaca. And this, the level of the sea cave has gone up and down. The roof fell in, and the archaeological layers were now underwater, about, under about a meter and a half of water. So it was very difficult um, to excavate. Uh, Benton brought in pumps. They kept breaking down. They built a kind of case on a sort of a retaining wall to keep the water out and pumped out the cave. Finally, they got in a big, all this stuff had to come in by boat. Finally, they got in a proper pump and were able to drain the floor of the cave and to start excavating. So Benton established through excavation that the cave was a center of worship for about 900 years, from about 1,000 BC, for most of the last millennium BC, from about 900 down to, um, um, sorry, from about 1,000 BC down to just before the AD period. Here's there's very nice um, information boards up uh, near, oops, <laughs> well, could it could have been me? <laughs> and this describes here. You can just see uh, the pipe for the pump. There, the cave floor is walled off. And here, are rather nice. The archaeologist enjoying a swim in the floor of the cave before before the whole thing has been pumped out. She found in this cave. Um, Offerings to numerous Greek gods, but especially to the nymphs, which has given the cave its other name, probably should be called that rather than be associated with Dr. Loizos, the cave of the nymphs, um, its other name. But Benton made two very remarkable finds also. And this is, um, they're all in the local museum in on Ithaca. So I was able to actually see them, which was wonderful. I'd only seen pictures before. Um, so firstly, she found a fragment of ceramic with inscribed on it in Greek, and there you can't, it's a fragment of a mask of a satyr, one of these creatures associated with Dionysus, like a sort of theatrical mask. Um, you can't see the writing there, but they've conveniently written it out for you. Efgen Odyssey, and the name of the person with Anetheke there. So and so dedicated this to the nymphs in the cave. And what the Greek means is a prayer for Odysseus. The mask was dated to the second century BC, so that's almost half a millennium after the Odyssey. But it shows that the island and this cave, and of, of course all of Ithaca, was firmly associated with Odysseus, at least by this time. And given that religious practice and ritual is so incredibly conservative, um, archaeologists have argued that this may well go back uh, many centuries before this actual find. So that was the one find. Benton's second, even more startling find was the remains of 12 tripods um, dating from the 800s BC um, down to, so the 9th century, down to around the time of the Odyssey, around 700 BC. So over a period 
of about two centuries, you can see from the change in style. Um, so, taken together with the tripod destroyed by Loisos, that makes 13 tripods, which is the number um, that seems to be given to Odysseus by the Phaeacians. And again, here's the excavations going on, the pumping, and here are the tripods, bits of tripods, crushed obviously by the collapse of the roof, um, but in, intact in the floor of the cave. There's one of these large circles that decorated the rim of a tripod. Here are parts of the legs over there. So remnants of a tripod libes. The libes refers to the bowl lying on the ground. So. And here are the bits in the cave. Here's one of the, the rings, perhaps the one we saw a moment ago. Um, here again the legs and part of the, the shape of the bowl. They were elaborately decorated. Here you can so expensive, you know, these are luxury items. Quite remarkable that things like this would be on a small, insignificant backwater like Ithaca. Um, I mean, it was not a rich place, where it was not a great center of cult, cult like Delos or Delphi or anywhere like that. A horse on the rim here, a figure of a rider. Uh, <laughs> it's rather nice to think that this is Odysseus and his dog. <laughs> Uh, anyway, a human a figure with a dog on this ring here, and he has a reconstruction of this particular tripod, one of the later ones from around 750. So this precise number of 13 physical tripods and the 13 tripods that the epic says Odysseus brought back to Ithaca and stowed in a cave of the nymphs. Of course, this is not the cave of the nymphs where he lands, but one must assume he brings his treasure back um, to closer to home, means that there has to be some connection. I mean, exactly what is hard to say, but some connection between Homer's Odyssey and this archaeological fact. I mean, if you look at the time scale, um, as I said yesterday in answer to the question, from, for about 500 years, you have poetry about Odysseus passed on orally as part of the whole Trojan saga. Then from the early 800s down to 700, 13 tripods put in the cave of the nymphs in Polis Bay on Ithaca. And then around the end of the 8th century, Homer composes the Odyssey with the story of Odysseus bringing home 13 bronze tripods which he puts in a cave on Ithaca. Um, as I see it, there are two possibilities here. Um, either a very ancient uh, pre-Homeric oral story conjured the sea cave tripods into existence, so people who made the tripods were thinking of an oral story. But given that these tripods were created over two centuries, it seems to be much more likely that there was this set of tripods in a cave which was seen by some poet, and they wove a narrative around it. That seems to me the likely explanation. And either way, I think the presence of these tripods and this prayer for Odysseus um, prove very conclusively that this island is certainly Homer's Ithaca and the Ithaca of the Odyssey. So I would say our search for Odysseus on the island was certainly successful. I certainly felt eerily close to it. The hero um, you know, swimming in his bay, looking at these things, drinking from Arethusa Spring. And here are the final little bits of the puzzle. Here's me with a bust of Homer, Omiros, set up in the main square of the main town of Vathi. The lines of Greek here are from the Emperor Hadrian, who was a great lover of the Greeks. He consulted the Delphic Oracle because there was so much dispute about Homer's birthplace, and the oracle replied with these lines here, which basically say that Agnoston um, uh, his seat was on Ithaca, and Telemachus was his father, and Nestor's daughter Epicaste was his mother. 
It's a very improbable tale that Telemachus and a daughter of Nestor were the parents of um, Homer. But, of course, the Ithacans love this improbable story that Homer was an Ithacan. So they've adopted him as a son of the island. And they've put up a, a rather nice statue of uh, Odysseus, a kind of double figure again with his cap, the sort of uh, mature warrior, and then here the exhausted figure plying his oar, arriving back home on, a, on the island. I must say there's also there's a, a plaque dedicated to Penelope across the, um, across the bay, the, uh, the harbour over there, so she gets some recognition too. And then finally, there's our car going onto the car ferry, leaving from Same, uh, sorry, leaving from Ithaca to go to Same, which is still the name of the, peri for, um, the ferry port on Kefalonia. So that ancient name still survives on Kefalonia as the name of one of its ports. Okay, thank you. Again, as yesterday, I mean, if anyone who needs to go, please feel free. Otherwise, questions, I'm happy to try and answer if I can. Anyone have anything to ask? Yes? Of, well, I mean, Homer, um, the earliest full manuscripts only come from about the um, 8th century AD, complete manuscripts of Homer. But um, particularly since the late 19th, early 20th century, been huge excavations of old ancient rubbish dumps in Egypt, which have turned up thousands and thousands of pieces of papyrus. And the two authors that are particularly popular were, Homer is by far the best represented, best represented. I mean, most of these things are old tax bills and receipts, rather boring stuff. But sometimes on the back it's been reused, and sometimes they're actually literary fragments. Homer is by far the best represented author, so thousands and thousands of papyri. Um, the, just scraps, you know, sometimes you get almost a whole book, maybe, in very rare cases. It's usually it's just a couple of lines or half a line. Or, but because the text is so well known, scholars can normally slot them into place. And what's remarkable is how the er very earliest papyri go back to the 4th century BC. So um, still you know, several centuries after Homer. So, but you know what's remarkable? There are a lot of so-called wild lines in the papyri. So because this is such an oral text and you get so many repeated lines, sometimes the papyri slot in a repeated line where it's not in the manuscript tradition from later. But really, in general, the text of Homer, because it was so much used, so much a staple of Greek education, it's, it's very stable. The text, I don't think, is significantly different from the received text that's come down through the, the manuscript. So, you know... I think, in essence, there you've got the same Iliad and Odyssey that were read in antiquity. Hmm. Okay, tomorrow I'll be talking about translation, trans uh, translating the Odyssey. Thank you. Thank you. Made me go and do. Go and do stuff. <laughs> uh, the, what the, other one, the other one was Peter the Great. It made me want oh, to yes, read Kate. his biography. Is that everything <laughs> this one made me want to go to Greece as quickly as possible. Yeah. Super. Oh, yes. I nearly walked off with that. I'm sure you've got an important question. I'm just saying hello. <laughs>